I think most of you probably already know Professor Hill, but there are only a few people around who are able to take thermodynamics, continue to make it completely rigorous, and make it accessible to everybody. And so what, if whenever, whenever Professor Hill is talking, there's always a, a, a number of emails that I get, or, or Karen gets, that are basically people who follow Professor Hill around the, around the state. And every time he gives a talk, we're always guaranteed to have at least a half dozen of uh, the Professor Hill groupies who show up, because they, they, they will attend anything he speaks, any time he speaks. So without anything, without any further introduction, I'd like to introduce Professor Hill, uh, the uh, Professor Emeritus in the Mechanical Engineering Department, who, to talk about energy. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> in the uh, fall of 1941, I was an engineer with the General Electric Company in Schenectady working on steam turbines. I was very lucky because the U.S. was still in a deep recession and jobs for engineers were few and far between. At the same time in Europe, a major war was underway. In the summer of 1941, the Germans had invaded the Soviet Union. And by the fall, it looked like they were going to sweep through the Soviet Union the same way they swept through France and Belgium and so on. Well, in acknowledgment of these two events, the New Yorker magazine published its usual cartoon. It had a full page picture of a tombstone and a grave in front of the tombstone. And on the tombstone, the big letters at the top said, Economic Man. And then this verse appeared underneath. It's an economic man, he went a crooked mile. He made a crooked sixpence by economic guile. He bought a crooked cat that ate a crooked mouse, and they all fight together in their new collective house. This, this description of the, the depression. Now, that house has fallen in on economic man. It seems the present tenant's totalitarian, for a fascist cat pursues a communistic mouse and they all fight together in their new collective house, World War II. Epilogue. But sociologic man, inheriting this mess, will serve the common welfare with social consciousness. Cooperative cats will fraternize with mice, and we'll all romp together in a social paradise. Well, my generation had a shot that serving the public welfare with social consciousness, and I'll leave it to you, we didn't do very well. So it's up to your generation to give it another shot, to see if you can serve the common welfare with social consciousness. Now, what does it mean to be able to do this? I don't know what words you could use that would uh, carry this through, but I like the word literacy. That is, I think we need a whole lot of economic literacy. We need a whole bunch of political literacy. We need a whole bunch of social. We need to know a lot of things. And one of the things we need to know a lot about is energy and its relationships. And I want to take a little time this morning, this noon, and talk to you about energy literacy. Uh, you see so many times the uh, newspapers will report uh, megawatts when they mean kilowatt hours a year. They just get the, get the numbers wrong. And I want to get, get it through to you that it's part of your responsibility to write a letter to the editor and say, wait a minute, no, you didn't come and got it right. You don't know the difference between rates and quantities. The, what your reporter should have said was this. He shouldn't have said that. Well, now, where do you go to get literacy in, 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 in energy? Well, the U.S. Department of uh, 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 the Energy Information Agency it's a, uh, they have a hundred million, hundred billion dollar a year, no, hundred million dollar a year budget. They don't report to the U.S. Department of Energy. They report to committees of Congress that frees them from any influence of, of any political influence. Uh, they publish every year uh, an annual energy outlook. And here's the one from last year. This year's just came out, but it's still online. They don't have a hard copy of it. And as you can see, it is just an uh, uh, index of a whole bunch of numbers that uh, they look into with great care. One of the interesting aspects of it is that in the inside of the first page is a list of all the people who are responsible for each chapter in the book. And they have not only an email number, but a phone number for every member. 
And I write columns for the Ellsworth American, and I taught here, and so quite often there's a, a curve in here where I don't understand the abscissa or the ordinate or something. So I will look the guy up, and the lady up, whose name is listed as being responsible for that chapter. And to my major surprise, they pick up the phone. You'd think you'd get some kind of answering service and whatever. But when it says Joe Jones is responsible for the production of coal, you pick up his phone number and then Joe Jones picks up the horn. And uh, this interesting change here, when I was teaching, I used to do that. I would call who was ever, and I said, there's a chart on page 43, and the abscissa I don't quite understand. And he would look up and then he'd say, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, and I said, can you, uh, can you uh, improve that form? Not improve it, but can you explain that to me in more detail? Yeah, he says, I could write something up. Uh, what's your address? And I'd tell him my address, and a week later I'd get it in the mail, and that'd be that. Then I retired from teaching in 1962, and I uh, took on other operations, including writing uh, columns for various magazines. And I now write continually for the Ellsworth American. And I, then I run into the same thing. I get an article in here I don't like, or I get a chart I don't understand the words to. I call a guy, uh, our lady, and uh, I say, uh, this is Mr. Hill. I write columns for the Ellsworth American. I'm looking at page 96 of your, your annual energy outlook, and I see a chart that I don't know what the abscissa is of the chart. Can you explain it to me? And I, they say, uh, uh, well, what's your telephone number? And I tell them, get right back to you. And uh, it seems I'm a much more important inquirer as a writer for the Ellsworth American than I ever was as a professor of mechanical engineering. That's an interesting thing to have come back. So well, what I want to do this morning is go through some of the work that's in here and try to, and try to make it uh, 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 intelligible. Um, uh, this just came, this is, a, this is a year old. The chart you see here was uh, published uh, uh, just, just came over the transom. The new, the new annual energy outlook has just been published, and it's online, and I took it from there. Now, there's several things about this that I think are interesting to note. They, they have a line here of 2013, that's where the latest data is, and they project it out to the 2000, year 2040. And I think uh, one of the big surprises about this, there is no surprise. That is, here are people with a $100 million a year budget that have hundreds of professionals and outside contractors. They know every oil well is drilled anywhere in the world. They know what the log is on that oil well. They know how much of it has been produced. And all of this stuff is under strict surveillance by the Energy, by the energy Information Administration. And uh, you see back in uh, the year 2080, the, uh, the uh, in increase in energy use up until about 1995 or six, and then it stays flat from there on out. Now the unit is a, uh, is a quadrillions of BTUs known as quads. It's interesting that they should use that. They have historically, and they don't want to change it because it'd be very hard to do. The rest of the world all uses joules or joules or joules, depending on what part of England you come from. Well, it's very easy to convert uh, quadrillions of BTUs to joules because you know that there's a thousand joules in a BTU. So if you've got 10 to the 15th power BTUs, that's a quadrillion, 10 to the 15th power BTUs. If you're gonna do that in joules, it'd be 10 to the 18th power, wouldn't it? Same numbers, just change it from 15 to 18 and you've got the whole thing in joules, all right? Now, uh, 10 to the 9th is a giga. So 10 to the 18th ought to be a giga giga. And the unit is a jowl. So it would be giga giga jowls, which I think is a hoot. <laughs> but unfortunately, some spoil sport came along and says 10 to the 18th is an exa. So if you do these in joules, you have 10 to the 18th, ex, uh, uh, 10 exa jowls instead of giga giga jowls, which I think is too bad. Um, <laughs> now, You'll notice here that there have been some slight changes. Uh, coal was 23% of the load back in, in uh, 1990. Now coal has gone to uh, 18%. But look at what they've done. They project out to the year 2040, still 18% still coal. Now where's all this global warming stuff? You know, you think that the, they, that when we get into the next few slides, we'll see that they just don't believe what Congress is gonna be able to do. They just don't think it's gonna be possible. Uh, now, 
the, uh, okay. And then you can see that natural gas has increased a little bit. It's gone from 23% of the total to 27%. They project 29% out of the year 2040. They don't think much, different, much is going to happen to uh, liquid biofuels. But very interesting, they think nuclear is flat. And I think most of us would say, hey, there are going to be some closings in there somewhere. We have 100 nuclear plants, and we just closed uh, Vermont Yankee. Uh, why, why can they claim that in the year 2040 we'll still have 18 percent of the energy will be, in, uh, will be nuclear? The reason is that uh, like all power plants and a nuclear power plant is a whole bunch of stuff in series. There are pumps and compressors and evaporators and condensers and so on. And there's one thing in that string that says this far and no farther. It, it might be the boiler feed pump for instance. Everything else is working fine, but the boiler feed pump is right up to here and you can't pump another gallon through it. So now what happens when you uh, replace the boiler feed pump? Put in a little bigger pump. Now there's something else in the rig that is limiting. So you see that, uh, that gradual incremental improvements in the nuclear enterprise will keep the nuclear enterprise at 8% per, at, uh, at, uh, uh, of the total energy. Uh, uh, regardless of the fact that there may be some plants, some plants closed in the meantime. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't tell that from down. Now, this, this goes back a little ways, and um, unfortunately, it's 2007 data. But as you can see, there wasn't much difference between 2007 and the present. That line was pretty flat in there. But what this curve does, it shows you where the energy comes from and where it goes. And I think this, now there's been very small changes in this, as you can see from the first slide. And I think this is a really, uh, a very important and, uh, and uh, uh, document. Here we have the sources of energy, petroleum, natural gas, coal, renewable, and nuclear. Uh, and then on the other side, you have the, the, where the energy goes, transportation, industrial, residential, and commercial, and electric power. And the way the slide is set up, it tells you how much of what goes where. Obviously, 100% of the nuclear goes to electric power. But electric power is only 21% nuclear. Do you see how it works? Now, a couple of surprises here. Here's renewable energy, and they've got 9% of the renewable energy going to the transportation sector, and 2% of the transportation sector is, renew is renewable energy. What's going on there? Where does renewable energy enter the transportation sector? Oh, come on. Ethanol and gasoline. That's where that comes from. I think I'd like to, uh, time is, uh, I think I'd like to stop for 15 or 20 seconds and just let you look at that chart. And I want to inquire from you rhetorically, is there a surprise there? Is there anything you say, oh my God, I didn't know that was true. Let's, let, let me just shut up and let you look at that for a minute. And then somebody will volunteer, I hope, a couple of surprises. Well, where there's 100 quads, these are really percentages, aren't they? Now, what that says is that 40% of all energy flows in the United States go to make electricity. That's a surprise, I think. Given the transportation sector, the industrial sector, and so on, I would have thought that that would have been smaller than that. But 40% of the, uh, of the uh, energy flows in the United States uh, are, uh, are, are flow into electric power generation. And I want to, I think, and some of it is nuclear, and some of it is renewable, and some of it is, but look at 91% of the coal goes to make electric power. And that's why that coal hangs out there so long, and you're not going to get rid of coal with other units. I, I like to think of this, uh, that uh, a main household uses about 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. If you go to this book, you can find that the coal miners' productivity is around uh, 30 to 40 uh, tons of coal an hour. And that's one of the telephone calls I made to the, uh, the, the, this department. I called the coal guy and I said, you, you print the, num the tons of coal per miner hour at being 40 or 50 tons of coal per miner hour. What's a miner? What's the definition of a miner? 
And he said, anybody at the mine site who's paid by the hour is a miner. He might be a diesel mechanic, he might, but if he's, if he's at the site where the coal, mine, coal is mined, and he's an hourly paid employee, he's, he's a miner. So that isn't just the guys that dig the coal. This is, this is everybody at the shop uh, is, is thrown into that. Now, uh, a, uh, a main household uses about uh, 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. Now, some more, some less, depending on whether you use electric hot water or not. Now, it takes about a pound of coal to make a kilowatt hour. One miner working for one hour can produce enough coal which when taken to a modern coal to electric plant can keep a main household in electricity for seven years. Now let's start shutting down the coal. Very hard to do. Hard to do technically, harder to do politically. Because you've got 27 states that have coal mines in them. And those coal mines and those coal, they pay a lot of taxes. They support the schools and the roads. And to say, no, you can't do that anymore because CO2 in the atmosphere is a bad thing and we got to, they can't do it. Just politically. That's why the, these guys that are sitting down there in Washington that have a budget of $100 million a year just say that coal's going to hang right in there. There isn't the political courage out there to do anything significantly, anything significantly about it. So is there anything else there that we, we need to comment on? Okay. Now, I want to say, we're going to run into this again a little later. These are energy flows. This, this is, when, when, when it talks about quadrillions of BTUs per year, this is not a quantity of energy. This is a flow of energy through the system. This is the way the energy moves from coal to electric power to whatever. I'll figure this out by the time we get to the end. All right. Now, this is the... This is the energy, this is, this is a little later data, 2009, but this is where the energy comes from. Here's coal, 21%, natural gas, 25%, petroleum, 37%, and here's the renewables, which are 8%. And then they break out the renewables and they show what that is as 100%. That is 35% of all the renewables is hydropower, as you would expect. 24% uh, is wood. Now, a lot of that has to do with industrial processing. Paper mills that burn wood as part of the paper making process gets countered as wood. Biofuels, 20%. Wind, 9%. Biomass and waste, 8%. Uh, geothermal, 5%. And solar, 1%. So renewables take up 8% of the total, and that's the way the renewables are divided up um, among the various, various categories. Now, there have been some small changes in it, um, but. Uh, I'm sorry. When you're 96 years old, your hand shakes. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. Ah, there. Now I'm in sync. Now that was that last chart I showed you was a little out of date. This just came over the transom. I just picked this off the web in the last week, and it's their opinion. This, this, these people got the $100 million budget and know everything about all energies. It's what their projection is as to what the non-hydro-renewable energies are going to look like out to the year 2040. Now, right now, the, I wrote on the, on the slate there, we, because we need the information in order to make sense out of this, the United States now uses 4,000 billion kilowatt hours a year. So this is here now is... Uh, the uh, billions of kilowatt hours from non-hydro renewables. So right now, when you get out to 2015, we're 300. If we were 400 billion kilowatt hours, we would be 10% of the electricity. That's why I wrote 4,000 billion on the board. 4,000 billion kilowatt hours a year is the amount of electricity produced in the United States. The renewables now here produce less than 300. Now, all these really bright guys have got ideas as to what they're going to do. And they say, well, it depends. It depends on whether the, the price of oil is high. If, the, if oil price and, gas, and the gas resource is good and there's low economic growth, renewables aren't going to amount to thing. We'll use natural gas and oil, and the renewables will just, fall, just collapse. Now, the reference case is what they think is going to happen. That's what these wizards that uh, make all this big money think is going to happen out of the year 2040. If they have high economic growth, 
Uh, that means they're going to put a lot of pressure on resources, and they think they're going to use more renewables if you have high economic growth. If you have low uh, oil and gas resources, if the price of oil and gas goes up, then you'll have more, re more renewables. And now, right now, they're paying, uh, uh, as you know, uh, strong um, rewards to people that make solar and, uh, and uh, wind energy. And every year it comes up in the budget, there's a phrase, they're, they're afraid they're going to stop the subsidies. And that, that's thought of over and over again. So what these wizards say, the amount of renewables are going to continue to rise if there's no sunset on the subsidies. So they continue to pay two cents a kilowatt hour for wind energy and so on. The amount of renewable energy used will go up and up because of the reward associated with the, with the uh, uh, re uh, renewable energies. Now that top green line says GHG 25. Well, I was bright enough to figure out what GHG meant. That greenhouse gas is what GHG means. But I had no idea what the 25 meant. I, went, I read the book, read all the chapters, and couldn't figure it out. Well, I've got a, uh, a uh, house full of PhD candidates, and I said to one of them, I'm stuck on this GHD 25. And he said, let me look at the book. So he said, ah, and he found it. If they put a $25 tax on every ton of CO2, then you're going to get high renewables. So the GHG 25 means that if there is a tax of $25 a ton on carbon dioxide, you'll see a lot of renewables in the grid. Okay. But now what do the boys in the back room think? Not a chance. That is, they think there's going to be a sunset. See, that's the black line. That's the reference line. That's the consensus of the people that, are, uh, that, that make these graphs and charts, the people who, people who, who publish this book. Now, the per person use of electricity is a matter of interest. Uh, there's a 100 times 10 to the 15th. That's the uh, well, per person use of energy, not electricity. There's 100 times 10 to the 15th. That's the uh, uh, total amount of energy. That's the coal, the oil, the natural gas, the renewables, and so on. Now, I divide that by 3 times 10 to the 8th. That's the population of the United States. I divide that by 3 times 10 to the 3rd, that's the uh, BTU in a kilowatt hour. I divide that by 10 to the 4th, which is the number of hours in a year. I made this presentation at some group, I've forgotten what it was now, and there was a panel. And when some other member of the panel got up, if Dick Hill can say there are 10,000 hours in a year, I guess I can say, well, 10,000 hours in a year is 10 to the 4th, close enough. I'm not going to fight the, the numbers all the way out. There's the BTU per year, U.S. population, kilowatt hours per BTU and hours per year. That turns out to be 10 kilowatts per person. So as we sit here, somewhere out there is the flow of 10. Now, 10 kilowatts is a flow. It's a rate at which energy is moving through the system, 10 kilowatts per person. Now, there's a little book that comes out every year. Oh, here it is. If you subscribe to the uh, Economist of London, they give you a little book free. And they have, for every country, they have the per capita consumption of energy. But they use, they put it up in kilograms of petroleum equivalent per person, instead of in kilowatts. So I wrote the conversions on the sideboard there. So you start out with 10. That's the flow of energy in kilowatts. And the next thing I do is multiply it by the number of hours in a year, 8,760. The next thing I do, yes, is, is multiply it by 3413, which is the BTUs in a kilowatt hour. I divide it by 20,000, and then I divide it by 2.2, and I get the number they get. That is 7,000 kilograms of petroleum equivalent is the rate at which the United States consumes energy. That's the same thing as the 10 kilowatts. The 10 kilowatts is the flow of energy. The 7,000 kilograms of oil equivalent is a, a year is the flow of energy through the United States. Now, there's about um, 
I guess what, uh, 10 kilograms, what, what is the, oh, 100 kilograms would be a barrel of oil, wouldn't it? 10, 100, 100 kilograms, what do you think? 100 kilograms, okay. So that means there's 70 barrels of oil a year for every one of us. So I like to think, uh, that's per year. So I like to think of the barrels of oil if we stacked them out, went out in the foyer and, and put barrels all down, put barrels all down, the, put barrels all around here, build, build out that door and put barrels out in the foyer again and around. Each one of us is responsible for that much petroleum equivalent a year. Now some of it's nuclear, some of it's hydro, and so on. But that's the amount of energy we use per year. Uh, now uh, the uh, uh, I told you that the 10 was the kilowatt hours per year. I told you the 8,760 hours per year. I told you the 3,000, uh, the 3,413 is BTU per kilowatt hour. Uh, I've got $5 for somebody that told me what the 20,000 is. This, this is mixed money, so <laughs> it'd be free. Nobody can tell me what the 20,000 is? Well, the whole thing is converting kilowatts. Don't say kilowatt hours. Kilowatts, that's a rate at which energy flows through the system. From your, your energy unit, yeah. which in that case is... Yeah. That's the BTU per pound of petroleum. 20,000. Now, mostly you think of the BTUs uh, for gallon of petroleum. Well, gallons go way all over the place. I mean, propane's way down, number six is way up, you know. But per pound... 20,000 BTUs for petroleum this about goes across the board. That is, if you're talking about number six oil, it's very dense, so you don't have much of a pound. Uh, propane is not very dense, so, but you still, the 20,000 is the BTU per pound of petroleum. You gotta have that in the equation if you're gonna come out at the end of the thing with the kilograms of, uh, of petroleum equivalent. Now, uh, I won't give away money on the 2.2, but what's that? Ah, turns pounds, turns pounds into kilograms, okay. So if you go through that, you start with a 10, kilo, 10 kilowatts per person, uh, and you convert it, you wind up with uh, 7,000 kilograms of oil per person year is the rate at which the United States consumes energy. It's fun to look through the little book, because this is true for every country, they have that number in there. And of course, we're one of the very high numbers. But when you look at the air, the, uh, uh, the uh, the area of the, of the world, of the, uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and so on, they're way up, much, much higher than we are in terms of kilograms of oil equivalent per year because they, they're floating in the stuff and they squander it in ways that we, that we don't. Okay. Now here's the energy to electricity. And here I'm going to give away some money. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the 40 times 10 to the 15th, do you remember what that is? That goes back to the chart, yes? Uh, 40% of the uh, 100. Exactly. The, the, remember down here in the corner was the energy goes to electricity and it was 40. Uh, so 40% 40 of the energy or 40 a quadrillion BTUs a year uh, flows into the electric, the electric arena. Okay. Now, uh, now, I divide that by 10 to the fourth power, 10,000, and I get 4,000 times 10 to the ninth kilowatt hours a year, and that's right. If you go to the book and say, how much electricity do we generate in the United States? 4,000 billion kilowatt hours a year. Now, I thought 3413 converted uh, BTUs to kilowatt hours, and here I'm using 10,000. There's $5 for the guy that can shout, shout out! No, 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 no. <laughs> It's the second law. If you put thermal energy into generating electricity, you put in 10,000 units to get 3413 out the other side. Right? So why do I divide it by 10,000? It's the second law. Come on now. Why do I divide it by 10,000? Second law. Second law. Thank, you for, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, so now, I, I take 4,000 times 10 to the 9th, I divide it by 330 times 10 to the 6th, it's the population in the United States, and I get 12 times 10 to the 3rd, that, that now is kilowatt hours a year. 
Hmm. What relationship does that have to the 10 kilowatts we said that everybody uses? If I take a 12 times 10 to the third and divide it by the number of hours in a year, I'll get kilowatts. And instead of getting 10, I get 1.4 kilowatts. So 10 is the number of kilowatts that flow all the while through the system for every energy that he, the coal, oil, natural gas, propane, you think of it. The amount that comes out of the electricity plant is only 1.4 kilowatts per person. And what is the big reason? No, I won't go through that. Okay. Uh, the, the population of the United States as a whole is the 12 times 10 to the third. Uh, Maine uh, uh, only has, uh, the, our, our uh, uh, consumption of electricity is 11 billion kilowatt hours a year, and our population is 1.3 million, so we're 8.5 times 10 to the third kilowatt hours per, per year. Now, why is it that uh, we're so low? For a couple of reasons. We don't have big air conditioning load. Uh, secondly, uh, electric rates are pretty high. And secondly, we, our, our industry does not... Uh, does not, is not that, that, that energy intensive. So we use 8.5 times 10 to the third uh, kilowatt hours a year, whereas the, uh, um, the, the U.S. as a whole uh, uses uh, 8.5. Now, uh, we often think that uh, we can uh, turn the forest into energy. And uh, I... Uh, I've been to the forestry people, and they, they say that we've got uh, 0.69 tons of biomass per acre year. That's what, they, that's what we grow. So if you uh, do what uh, foresters do, sit on a stump, wear a hard hat, and watch the trees grow, that's what you see. That is, that's the photosynthesis. That's 0.69 pounds of biomass per acre year is what's growing. So I say, well, that's 2,000 pounds per ton, and that's 8,000 BTU per pound of biomass so that's 10 times 10 to the 6 BTU per acre year. So if you, if you watch, the, watch the forest grow, uh, the, that's the, how much energy you add from photosynthesis every year. Now I take that number, 10 times 10 to the 6, uh, I divide it by 10 to the 4th, that's the number of hours in a year, and I divide it by 3,000, that's the BTUs per kilowatt hour. So you get 0.3 kilowatts per acre. That is 300 watts. Is, is, the, is the rate at which photosynthesis is creating energy in the forest. Now, uh, we, take, uh, we have 17 million acres of forest, so you take 0.3 times 17 million, you get 5 times 10 to the 6 kilowatts for the main forest. That's the rate at which the main forest is creating energy. Now, you divide that by, by the population, 1.3 times 10 to the 6, and you get 4 kilowatts per person. Too bad. We like to think that we could dynamite the Kittery Bridge and with a little thermodynamic ledger domain, we could, in the whole hocus pocus, we could convert the forest into, into, into energy and we could uh, live out the rest of our lives and never pay attention to the rest of the world. You can't make it. There ain't enough energy in the woods to do it. You get four kilowatts per person uh, when we use 10 kilowatts per person. Oh, let me skip that one. Uh, no, the, this, I guess, is, is worth the few minutes it takes. Um, there's a lot of talk about sequestering uh, the carbon dioxide from coal. Uh, and a lot of money has been spent, and a lot of research grants have been written, and a lot of graduate students have been supported trying to, <coughs> to capture the CO2. Well, about 2,000 times 10 to the 9th, the kilowatts come from burning coal. Now, when you, when you realize that coal is largely carbon, and uh, uh, the atomic weight of carbon is 12, and the carbon, atomic weight of uh, carbon dioxide is 44. So you got a lot of carbon dioxide from burning coal. It isn't that one pound of coal gives you one pound of carbon dioxide. It gives you a lot more than that. So I've said two to one. So I've said that if the amount of coal, we have eight, 80 times 10 to the ninth uh, oh, uh, cubic, feet of carbon, uh, uh, cubic feet of CO2 as a liquid, a carbon dioxide liquid, which uh, has to be put at 1,000 pounds per square inch, has a density of about the same as water, 50 pounds per cubic foot. So if we're going to capture the carbon dioxide, we've got to capture and deal with 80 times 10 to the 9th cubic feet of carbon dioxide. And of course, it won't stay as a gas. You've got to 
compress it as a liquid and uh, store and, and keep it as a liquid, or it'll obviously get back in the atmosphere. So now uh, I've taken 20 million barrels a day as the uh, amount of petroleum we use, uh, and uh, I've said it's about five cubic feet in a barrel. So we have about uh, uh, and was 400 days in a year. So you have about 40 times 10 to the ninth cubic feet of oil per year that we consume now. That oil gets sloshed around in trucks, gets delivered to gas stations and so on, all at atmospheric pressure. And if you're gonna sequester the CO2 from burning coal, you gotta sequester twice that volume. And you gotta sequester it at 1,000 pounds per square inch. I mean, you're not gonna do it, you can't possibly do it. Uh, just think of the power plant liability. If a, if a pipe springs a leak and CO2 starts to leak out of the leak and gets in somebody's basement, I mean, the liability is, you just not, don't, don't even think about it. Uh, the, the, the idea that you're going to capture carbon dioxide and somehow sequester it is, 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 is not going to happen. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of my refrigerator at home. I've since re revised it, but I've, you can see in the background the coffee pot on the table there and so on. Well, I put a watt-hour meter on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the refrigerator, and I found it took about a kilowatt-hour a day. Then I put the insulation on it, and it took uh, 0 0.78 kilowatt hours a day. So I saved 0.22 kilowatt hours a day by putting uh, insulation all over my, my refrigerator. Now this is nothing. The kilowatt hour weighs is less than 20 cents. So you're only talking four or five cents, a nickel or so, to, for all the clutter and the duct tape and all the rest of it to save four or five cents a day. But now uh, there's my 22 cents and 365 days out of the year. Now there are 10 to the eighth households. You see there, there are what, 300 million people and if you take three people per household, that's uh, 10 to the eighth households. So you multiply by 10 to the eighth and you get nine, you get eight times 10 to the ninth kilowatt hours a year. That's Seabrook. That's what Seabrook does when it's doing a good year. So I can put this trivial amount of insulation on the side of my refrigerator and I can pick up as much energy as the Seabrook nuclear plant puts in, the, uh, puts in the grid every year. The reason, of course, is 10 to the 8th. There's a lot of refrigerators out there. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, now, uh, well, uh, Clinton, when he was president, said he was going to have a million solar roofs. And both sides of the House stood up and applauded. That is, the Republicans and the Democrats all said, that's great, Pre Prexy, go for it. So uh, I uh, uh, made this little chart, and I said, a million solar roofs, there's 10 to the 6, that's a million solar roofs. I said, the efficiency is about 10%, and the, I had, that's what 10 square meters, 100 square feet up on the roof. Now I said, five hours a day of clear day, no cloud sunshine, and there are 365 days out of the year. That's two times 10 to the ninth kilowatt hours a year. Nothing, nothing. Now my arithmetic here has a little of what I would call algebraic ledger domain. Now I got $5 for somebody who'll tell me what algebraic ledger domain means. What does ledger domain mean? Magic. Magic, ah, who, who said magic? You'll get five dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So the first place, the efficiency of 10 percent. They're, they're over 20 percent now. Uh, and I said we're going to have uh, uh, 10 square meters of solar collector. That's only 100 square feet. That, that, no, that's peanuts. That's not very much. Now the five hours is pretty, pretty, pretty optimistic. But what I'm trying to say is you've got to make a whale of an investment in uh, photovoltaic arrays before you can make a dent in uh, what our energy consumption is and what it'll do. Because here, I've, I, with my numbers, which are full of algebraic ledger domain, <laughs> uh, produce uh, two times 10 to the ninth kilowatt hours a year when Seabrook does eight times 10 to the ninth kilowatt hours a year. So that uh, you've got to, uh, and in spite of the fact that I've claimed five hours per day as the, uh, as the uh, clear day, no cloud sunshine.
Now, uh, this is the waste from Maine Yankee. And all that waste represents uh, 125 billion kilowatt hours. There it sits. Now, you recall that uh, back in the previous slide, we showed that uh, Maine consumed 11 billion kilowatt hours a year. So here's more than 10 years of all electricity used in the state of Maine, and there the waste sits. And that, that uh, all of this happened during the time that I was deeply involved in it. I, in 1953, I went to Westinghouse and uh, worked for the shipping ports uh, nuclear power plant and uh, helped to design the thermal cycle for that. And when Maine Yankee was built, I took students down and we watched the thing go. And a lot of my students uh, were workers at Maine Yankee. So I followed Maine Yankee very closely throughout its whole, uh, its whole uh, history. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> when they had to build this thing, you know, there's two lines of fences there. <clears throat> and the question is how, and one thing I, I've said in the past, which is wrong, I've said that those concrete cylinders lined with stainless steel on and on and on. I have the uh, structural integrity of the stones at Stonehenge in England. And those stones at Stonehenge have been there for 4,000 years. Why can't these things sit here for 4,000 years? And that's, that's wrong. Those things have got O-rings in them. They've got ventilation in them. That, those are only good for 100 years. And you got, then you've got to do something. You've got to go back and go and do some repairs and so on. Now, how dangerous is that stuff? Well, if uh, somebody should get an Abrams tank and sneak up Route 1 in the dead of night, oh, <laughs> given the public attitude about nuclear, I was there when they started being Yankee in the 1960s. And they loaded the fuel rods on the truck down in some place in Connecticut, and they left the Connecticut at the end of the shift about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And they arrived in, at Wiscasset and over into Maine Yankee. Uh, it was uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. The New Brunswick newspaper said, nuclear fuel arrives in the dead of night. And that, well, so what? <laughs> That's when they loaded the truck. You know, but it has that kind of, of, of horrific uh, a reputation that makes it very difficult to do anything with, uh, with, with, with the nuclear enterprise. One thing I've said to them is that, oh, if you, if you sneak an Abrams tank up Route 1, and fire an armor-piercing round into one of these uh, casters and, and break it apart. What happens? Is there a gas in there? Would you have to evacuate Wiscasset? Is there a liquid in there that would get into the groundwater? No. All that's in there are metals. And you get a mess of broken metal all over the... And it'd be wicked bad in terms of trying to clean it up and so on. But you wouldn't evacuate Wiscasset. There would be chunks of metal on the ground in that vicinity. But I don't see that this is the great horror that everybody thinks it is. Now, one thing I've said to the people that are there, that you ought to take the fences down, put a, uh, a narrow-gauge railroad around the whole thing, uh, put a flat car on the railroad, and put on the flat car an air cannon that fires chalk-covered tennis balls. So for $5, you can get a load of tennis balls, and you can play the largest pinball machine in the world. You can go around there and pow, and watch bunch of ricochet amongst it. Then they could, count, they could count the number of hits that you got, and at the end of the day, you get a prize for whoever, get, whoever gets the most hits. Uh, you could have, uh, uh, you could have a little uh, uh, auditoriums around the place supported by all those who hate nuclear power. You could have the Union of Concerned Scientists, could have a little booth, and they could pass out stuff. And oh, look at that stuff over there. Ooh, that, that. Well, it doesn't amount to a thing. If, if, that's, the, if that's the problem, uh, and people conceive that to be the problem. I, I, I think our society is in, 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 worse, uh, in worse trouble. I know when I, because everybody now that I knew and that when I told, told the story, they, they would say, oh, Dick, don't say that. Don't, don't say that. Uh, okay. But they, they've all retired now and they're all gone. And there's another generation down there that I don't know. But they, I can call, you can call them on the phone. It's all public information. For instance, when the, you can't, maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. But up at the top here, and down at the bottom, there are little slots. There's a little slot up there, and a little slot down there. They, um, they rely on natural convection to cool it. And uh, of course, the birds migrating north fly over that, oh, nice and warm down there. And so they build nests in the vents. So somebody's got to get in there and scrape the, the, uh, the bird nests out of the vents. So it takes a little maintenance to keep that thing going. And they have endless detail of the micro the, the number of the people that work there have to wear badges, of course, 
And uh, when they go in to clear the bird nests out, they know how many microsieverts per year they get exposed to it. They compare that with what an airline pilot gets or something. And the maintenance of that thing is not, is not I, I don't think, a terribly, a terribly, great, a terribly great issue. But that's, uh, that, that when, they, when everybody cries bloody murder about the waste associated with nuclear, there's 125 billion kilowatt hours. And that's a lot of juice. And when people start talking about putting solar collectors on roofs and pinwheels on barn roofs and so on to generate electricity, ask them, you know, how many kilowatt hours a year? I, uh, the, uh, this may be not an appropriate story, but uh, when during the early part, before the U.S. entered World War II, uh, Roosevelt was trying to ship armaments to uh, Russia and to, and to England. And he was hitting a lot of political resistance in the United States, particularly sending arms to Russia. And so uh, uh, Roosevelt wired Stalin and said, I'm having political troubles here getting armaments to you guys because uh, your anti-religious stand uh, annoys a lot of Americans. And Stalin sent back a, 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 a teletype. How many divisions does the Pope have? And so when I look at these solar collectors on rooftops and pinwheels on barn roofs, uh, that, that, that comes to mind. How many divisions does the Pope have? That, that, that's, that, that, I mean, that's idealized, that's what you want to do. You want to have solar collectors on rooftops and pinwheels on barn roofs. You ain't going to amount to a thing. Not when you're looking at 125 billion kilowatt hours a year represented by that, by that, that you can, uh, the, uh, I know I, I get asked quite often, they say, we're having a roundtable discussion. And uh, we've got uh, solar people coming there, wind people coming there, and so on. We like to have you come because you're a nuclear guy. I, I'm not nuclear. I just like hot beer and, and I like hot showers and cold beer. Now, these other guys aren't going to deliver it. There's, there's no question about it. Now, this one is uh, there's an interesting story here. Uh, oh, I'm, 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 I'm golden, right? Not 10 minutes? All right. All right. Um, this this uh, appeared. This is one of the articles that I got out of the you, this 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 book here that uh, has uh, the use of wind energy, and uh, this is uh, they're pretty proud of this because the hourly wind generation in March 2014. So this is pretty pretty uh, pretty recent, uh, and here they've got 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 megawatts. Wow, that's a lot. A nuclear power plant's a thousand megawatts, and here you've got a couple of nukes sitting in the wind turbines. And these are March 4th, March 8th, March 15th, March 22nd, March 29th. And this is what happens at the Texas grid where they got a lot of wind power. That is the profile of how much wind power they generate. You can see it sometimes on some days. There, well, they said the record was set at 10,296 megawatts on March uh, 26, 2014. That's a lot. Two days later, they got nothing. Nothing. So what it means you've got to have out there in Texas, you've got to have a whole bunch of diesel generators sitting around all over the place waiting for the wind to die. Then you crank them up. Now, if you think that's the way to run an, an industrial-based society, I, I got news for you. That, that, isn't, that isn't going to work. The, uh, the, the period, oh, I, I, I passed out a, you have a sheet here that talks about various kinds of energy. And I have across the top of it stochasticity, periodicity, and dilution. And the, uh, the problem with, the, with, the, with this, when you look at this as a form of generating electricity, it's periodicity. It's the fact that it, no, it's stochasticity. The fact that you can't rely on it, it comes and goes. Uh, as I told you, I write columns for the Ellsworth American, and I, and I pleaded with my editor to run this curve on the editorial page and I wanted to write an article about it and how the, what, what the implication of this was. And I, oh, we don't put color on the editorial page. But I said, this is really important stuff. You've got to do it. OK, he did it. And so I wrote an article that, that said, look at what happens to wind power in Texas when you've got the equivalent of as many as uh, eight nuclear plants running one, and then two days later, you, they're all shut down. Well, I, I've written these articles for a long time, and I almost always get some response. I get an email or two, or perhaps a phone call, or some uh, citizen uh, wants more information or something. 
Well, when I wrote that one, nothing. I wrote the next week, I said, I thought I dropped a bomb instead I laid an egg. That is, after writing about this in the Ellsworth American, there was zero response. And I think this is a very important document to people that think we're going to survive on, on renewable energies of which wind is going to play an important role. Now, if you, get a lot, if you can build a lot of storage in the system, that's like the Dickey Lincoln School hydroelectric project or something, maybe you could uh, work it out, but it's going to be, I, I don't believe it. Anyway, okay. Now, you know, Oscar Wilde said of one of his characters, I don't think much of his principles, but he's got a delightful set of prejudices. And you, you're beginning to see mine, mine already. Now, let's, let's look at the pro same thing now that we had when the, with the wind. Except this is the sum total of nuclear plants in the United States. And what these are for 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014, that's the sum total of all the nuclear plants. Uh, and uh, there you can see that uh, uh, what happens is that in January and December, they're all pounding to the wall. That's they're all putting out uh, 32 times 10 to the 6 megawatts. That's 32 times 10 to the 9th kilowatts is what they're putting out. And they put that out in January when you need it. They put it out during the air conditioning season in, in, in the summer when you need it. Uh, and uh, 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 see, it, it peaks twice a year. It peaks in January and it peaks in June. The rest of the time they're refueling, doing maintenance and so on. Unlike the wind that is willy-nilly. You know, they just comes and goes whenever the wind decides to. You can schedule these suckers, and you can fix them when the wind, during, the, during the shoulder season. Now, I won't take, I've, I've, I was going to take time to go to the slate and do this, but uh, we could take an average of something like 60,000 um, uh, megawatt hours, uh, multiply that by, uh, by uh, 12, so we get it into, into megawatt hours a year. Uh, and uh, that would give us back, back to the 16% uh, that we found was the percent of uh, nuclear energy that was in the grid. But I won't, I won't, I'd rather take the time for Q&A than I would to go through that arithmetic. But I had planned to take this data, which is megawatt hours per month, and, and take it through as to how many megawatt hours a year it was and compare that with the original stuff, but I didn't do it. Uh, this is a, uh, came out of... Uh, the uh, London Economist, and there's Merkel trying to get the system to work, and she is, and this is a quote, in energy, Germany is trying to switch from nuclear and fossil fuel sources to the sun, wind, and biomass, but it is not going well. Electricity prices are going up, German companies are losing ground to foreign rivals, the carbon emissions are rising, not falling, deep reform is needed uh, to the huge and inflexible subsidies for renewables, which will cost 24 billion euros this year. Instead, the cabinet is making another reform engine, tweaking the system in ways that consumers and firms will not notice. They're going to lie to the public about what that power costs. It's going to be a lot of it's going to be buried in taxes. Some is going to be buried in rates. They're in deep. They're in deep in deep trouble. One of the troubles they're in is the wind power they've got is all in the North Sea. Their main industry is down near Munich. Uh, and so they're trying to run high voltage DC lines from the North Sea, and boy, they're hitting opposition. Don't run those wires through my backyard. So we're, all the citizens are yelling, no nukes, no coal, no CO2. We want to do it with renewables, but don't put the wires through, through here. That is, the location of renewables is not where the load is. Where the wind blows is not where the people live. And so they've got a major problem on their hands. And I, 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 I try to watch that very carefully with, um, with all the publications. And it's very clear that the writers for the, uh, for the uh, London Economist don't have a very uh, warm view of what, uh, of what, the, uh, what the prospects are. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is my last slide, uh, the uh, address to you engineers. The top picture there is the power station over in Milford. And I'm sorry I didn't get a picture from Old Town. Looking, looking at the power plant from Old Town, 
It's really a beautiful building. It's got those arched windows in it. It's got the glass clear story. It's got the slate roof. That's when they built that in 1910, they paid attention to the aesthetics of what they were doing to the community. And they built what I think is a beautiful building. Now that bottom picture is what they put in Stillwater last year. There's no interest at all in blending into the countryside and into the, uh, a building that looked good. Old Shore is five kilowatts and it works well and uh, doesn't take much maintenance and it's all renewable and so on. But I, 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 I urge you guys, when you get to be engineers, be thoughtful about what you do and the way it looks. Okay, I think that, that, that uh, that's, well that, yeah, okay. There are a few things that uh, I said that I, uh, I, I intended to say that I didn't, but I think, oh, yes, let me, I knew. The, this, this paper I passed out, uh, <clears throat> I, th I think what's on this paper is something that is, should be part of your, your energy literacy. Along the bottom, is the areas required in square meters. Uh, on the uh, abscissa is uh, the energy density in watts per square meter. Now if you look at supermarkets, they're up a little less than 500 watts per square meter. Because if you push your cart around Hanford's, you're, you and your cart are about a square meter. All the while you're pushing your cart around Hanford's, there is the ice cream, there is the, uh, 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 all of the open cases, there's the air conditioning, there's the dehumidification going on. That is, while you're pushing your cart around, every, every place your cart is, somewhere out there there's 500 watts pounding around to do the dehumidification, to do the air conditioning, to keep the ice cream hard and so on. Now you get down and look at the bottom and you can see that uh, wind power is about five watts per square meter. And you'll notice if you put in very much of it, it drops to about two watts per square meter. So can you put wind turbines on the top of, of Hannaford's and run? Can't come even close to look at the amount of space required to run a, uh, the uh, energy available from the wind to run, a, run, to run a supermarket. And here you've got biomass on here uh, that, uh, that uh, is uh, down, well here's my, 0.69 uh, 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 tons per acre year. Uh, this is the, the phyto mass is down a le less than one watt per square meter. So the idea that you're going to uh, grow trees on top of the <laughs> Hannaford and harvest the wood and make alcohol and, and oh, all <laughs> can't 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 come can't come close to it. Uh, the wind is interesting. That the wind starts out if you only have uh, an, if, uh, one two and a half acres of wind power. Uh, the, the stuff works up at uh, five watts per square meter. If you get out to, uh, uh, to uh, an area of a kilometer, uh, the, the uh, wind power density falls off. That is, when you begin to put up too many windmills, you actually change the local climate. That is, the wind changes when you put up that many wind turbines in one location. Um, and I think this is a very valuable uh, document to uh, give you a perspective. Oh, one thing that's kind of interesting here, notice houses uh, and photovoltaics overlap. Bush, I think you know this. You can build some kind of a house in some kind of a climate where you can run the whole darn thing with photovoltaics. You see the two, two boxes uh, uh, over, overlap. That is the, the house and the photovoltaics. They have an area which says, yes, you can run a residence on photovoltaics if you're in the right climate and you put enough photovoltaics up and so on. So, uh, and now I've said, I said that the 8,000 kilowatt hours per household year, and that's another thing that interests me. All these people that sell windmills tell, tell you how many households it will supply. Oh, this set, set of household will, will furnish electricity to 100 households or whatever. If you take the whole amount of energy used by the state of Maine, that is the 11 billion kilowatt hours a year, and divide it by the number of households, it's 20,000, not 8,000 kilowatt hours a year. This, this building, for instance, isn't part of the household, anybody's household, but you throw this into the average and then prorate it over all households. Each household has got to, got to dream up 20,000 kilowatt hours a year. So if you think you're going to put uh, 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 photovoltaics on a roof and so on, maybe you can get your household, but 
Down the street is a schoolhouse, and over there is a police station, and there's a Coast Guard station. All these things take energy, and it's going to be very hard to do. And so I, my three uh, sentences across the top is periodicity, stochasticity, and dilution. The periodicity is like solar energy, it comes and goes. The stochasticity is the randomness, which is what we saw in the windmills in Texas where the energy is, is highly random. Dilution is what you see on this chart. It takes a lot of square meters. Now somewhere I saw that uh, nuclear energy, I mean, if you look at the pressure vessel, it's 248,000 uh, kilowatts per meter squared. I mean, uh, the energy, if you fly up, uh, as I, if you go uh, uh, into New York City, you know at Three Mile Island there are two nuclear plants. I've often tried to find them and I can't. That is, they're just, they're just so small compared to the size of New York City that you go all over the place and you can't see them. You get out in Texas and all you can see is windmills for miles and miles and miles. So this dilution is not a matter of indifference. Okay, let me, let me quit there, Mix we're down the hour, and I'll happily uh, try to respond to any questions that you have or uh, anything that you think ought to be added to this discourse that I haven't, that I haven't talked about. No, okay. Well, that's very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, do you think that the effect that windmills can have on weather patterns is enough reason not to use them at all? No, no, it's very local. Yeah. No, I don't think it'll change the weather. But you've got to have an awful lot of them when you realize that a supermarket takes uh, 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 500 watts per square meter and a wind turbine is 0.2. You've got to cover a lot of space with wind turbines uh, to, to get, that, get, that much, get that much energy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very dilute resource. Yes? You see nuclear as a long-term, our long-term option for power? Generation. Yeah, I, I have a sarcastic answer. I say I have, in one hand, I have a copy of my birth certificate, and in the other hand, a copy of the American Experience Mortality Table, <laughs> and I don't have a problem. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I think that as, as a, the, there is no, if you believe in hot showers and cold beer, there is no choice but to go nuclear. You just can't do it otherwise. One thing, I, I have several students that uh, live with me that uh, are, are here and graduate students from China, and they tell me a bizarre, I think bizarre story. When they go to take a shower in their Chinese dormitory, there's a shower wing room, they have their little basket with their clean clothes and soap and whatever. They walk up to a stall, and what do they do? They swipe their card. And that gives them a minute and 30 seconds of hot water. And then they go out and soap down and so on, and then you go back and you swipe your card again. And it gives you another minute and 30 seconds of hot water and you rest down, all right? How would that go in the University of Maine if you decided that you wanted to, <laughs> that you were interested in carbon dioxide footprint of the university? And you said, well, they do this in China all the while. You have to swipe your card to get some hot water for a shower. That was sure cut down the amount of oil we burn and natural gas we burn right there. Oh, talk to me about that. Yeah. Yeah. So why do you think the Americans stand on nuclear so much different than, say, France? Oh, the question was, why is France so much different? I, I've got a, a, an idea about that, which may not be true. I think that American uh, nuclear power was put together by corporations. Westinghouse built the turbine, uh, the condenser was built by somebody else, and a corporation put the plant together. In, uh, in France, the post office did it. You know, seriously. They, they, put, they had the design and they built the plants just the same way you'd build a post office. What's wrong with that? But I think that the, that the, the, the folk wisdom of American energy posture is such that if, if big corporations are doing it, it's got to be evil. And I think that's, not, I, may, I may be wrong. Your judgment may be better than mine. Uh, but when you look at the safety, the, the nuclear enterprise is so much safer than any other enterprise you can think of. We kill 500 people a year in railroad accidents hauling coal. 
Of course, they're limited with one or two guys here and somebody else over there and so on. If the nuclear enterprise, if anybody gets hurt in the nuclear enterprise, a lot of my, my students are uh, in the nuclear navy and uh, they tell uh, all kinds of stories about, oh, the, this is of interest. The, uh, the uh, uh, shipyard down in Portland has been servicing nuclear submarines for a long time. A lot of people that went to work for the shipyard went into the nuclear side have now retired. The thing is that, that, that long. A lot of people went into the, the, the shipyard, worked in the non-nuclear side. They've looked at the epidemiology of that, the groups of people, all with the same physical characteristics, all with the same physical exams that they enter in and so on. And the people that work on the nuclear side live longer than the ones on the non-nuclear side. The, the statistics are pretty, small, pretty thin, but the data is pretty clear. Now they say the reason is that when they work on the nuclear side, they're just beat to death with safety. They gotta wash their hands every time they turn around and so on. And they think that safety carries over into their civilian life. And that they, they wind up being much more careful at home and everywhere else than the people who work on the non-nuclear side. So I think that, that, that kind of evidence, that, and of course they're extremely, uh, the, uh, I spent a lot of time at uh, Maine Yankee and they, they have a big engineering office and they have a ramp that goes up to the operating room, operating uh, deck, because that's on springs and it's for, for, uh, for seismic reasons. So the engineering office is not on springs. So uh, one of my former students is walking up the ramp to, to take his shift on the, in the operating room and he's, holding, he's putting on a necktie. And he turns and looks at me and he says, around here an ounce of appearance is worth a pound of performance. <laughs> and I think that, that's, that's true of the nuclear enterprise. They're really careful. Uh, and they don't, well, okay. Any other comment or question? Yes. Um, I know you already said the public perception of the danger of spent yeah. nuclear fuel isn't yeah. really an issue, but do you think that the introduction of thorium breeder reactors ah. that have no discernible <clears throat> waste that's going to stick around? Do you think that will change the dynamic? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, this reason I, I, I titled my little talk here, Energy Literacy, and I think this is going to be your job to, to become familiar with what this thorium technology is. And uh, one of the big things that, that enters the arena here, is there anywhere in the design of the facility and the recycling of the material that bomb material is available? That, in fact, that the, our, we're handcuffed, that Jimmy Carter, that every other country in the world reprocesses nuclear fuel and puts them back and recycles it. Every other country, we don't. Because Jimmy Carter said, I don't want the electric utility industry to in any way overlap the military. They're separate and they're gonna stay separate. If you reprocess fuel, there's a certain point in the pre-processing cycle where you've got weapons material. And we don't, and Jimmy Carter said, we aren't gonna do that. And, and we don't, where every other country does reprocess. And of course the thorium cycle would, would, would reprocess. Is there any other question or comment? Well, you've been very polite and I thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was, so uh, our next step is we're going over to Crosby Lab on the other side of the plaza here and we'll rotate through the different, uh, the different groups. We're starting out with uh, the solar thermal heating of an air-to-air -air heat pump. Uh, that'll be the first group. So we're starting out maintaining the energy, uh, energy theme as much as possible. The one thing that uh, Professor Hill did not point out there, too, was the, the, the I wanted to raise my hand, but I thought this, is the 2% of, uh, of uh, transportation fuel that comes from uh, natural gas. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so in that light, we're also, we will then go on with the compressed natural gas so, ah, very good. Let's thank Professor Hill. Oh, and, 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 and if you want, you keep the chart. If you don't, don't tear them up, throw them away. I, I, once in a while, I'll talk to a Aquinas Club or something. I'll pass these things out again. So as you leave, if you, don't, if you have an interest in it, keep it. If you don't have an interest in it, leave it on the back table when you leave. And I should note, I'm a little disappointed. There's a lot of money on the table here. And one of the answers was second law. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. a little okay. disappointed. This is not a good start. Thank you. Okay.